Good evening and thank you for joining me. It's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, but you can feel the distant rumblings of the approaching election. It's going to be a great fight over the months ahead. The trouble is, what confronts us is a good six months of phony issues, dumbed down contenders, and the journalists and politicians are equally to be blamed for that, all dressed up in a cut price imitation of an American presidential race. So far this year, the Parliament has sat for 16 days. Talk about value for money. So what passes for the political process is being acted out in headlines and tagged onto the end of market research about soap powder preference. Tuesday's Australian had the story that really mattered. Labor has maintained an election winning lead over the coalition in the week after its historic by-election victory in the Queensland seat of Ryan. Kim Beasley has kept a six-point lead over John Howard as the choice of better Prime Minister. The question asked by News Poll epitomises the worthlessness of media debate. Question. Who do you think would make the better Prime Minister? Just stopping them there, has nobody told journalists that we don't elect the Prime Minister? Today, the Oz dug into the News Poll results of last week to extract Prime Minister preferences in marginal seats, but nothing on the likely election issues. Better Prime Minister, marginal seats. John Howard. 39%. Kim Beasley. 35%. Uncommitted. 26%. But they go further, purporting to compare apples with lemons. Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the way John Howard is doing his job as Prime Minister? Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the way Kim Beasley is doing his job as Leader of the Opposition? Howard's marginal seat satisfaction level is... 35%. Dissatisfaction level... 55%. Beasley's satisfaction level, but not as Prime Minister because he isn't, is... 40%. And dissatisfied? 43%. So most people don't want him to be Opposition Leader, just as Howard is even less acceptable as PM. While thousands of respondents are asked those questions by news poll every fortnight, they're also polled on leaders' personalities. Under the headlines, Vision for Australia. Understands the major issues. Trustworthy. Likeable. Inflexible. In touch with the voters. Decisive and strong. Cares for people. Capable of handling economy. And arrogant. Although we're told that last category has been deleted since Paul Keating stepped down. While it'll come as no surprise that Beasley is way ahead on all the warm and fuzzy stuff, news polls respondents even think Beasley is only 1% less credible than Howard as an economic manager. Neither of them is credible, but they're now equally incredible. Roy Morgan, who hasn't released figures since June last year, plots movements in Howard's ratings in this same game of pursuing triviality, but it all starts to read like a popularity contest for a girls' school hockey mistress. Fair to everyone. Friendly, likeable. A strong leader. I like Miss Fothergill best. She's strict but fair. The category that fascinates me is... Easy to understand. Not articulate. Makes sense when you recall that voters don't like a clever dick. This immaterial and largely irrelevant entrail reading only serves the media's purpose of conflict creation. It does absolutely nothing towards the creation of an informed and thoughtful electorate. And can the conflict model become any more vacuous than having the antagonists line up with particular football teams? Yet imagine the weeks of apparatchik's anguish in deciding whether Port Adelaide sends the right message for the Lib leader or Melbourne for the ALP's man. Spin doctored image and the unspoken subtext of that creation by advertising agencies and media consultants will matter much more in the party's election messages than environment policies or defence or foreign policy. Thus, family values are the slogan of the family man. Subtext, let's see Beasley pose like this with wife and ex-wife? Family vote. Mr and Mrs Howard yesterday with Tim, 18, left, Richard, 15 and Melanie, 21. And ordinariness becomes a virtue. The unremarkable lad who made it to the lodge. From pumping petrol to the pinnacle of power, rise of a common man. 
The appeal to lower middle class conservatism is no accident. And Howard spin doctors know these headlines are pure gold. Howard, proud to be a plodder. But that was a year ago when their targets were altogether different. Beasley, let's not beat around the bush, is a fat man. That's the unspoken message of Howard's recent repetition that Labour is policy lazy or just lazy, fat and lazy, get it? So Howard's minders make sure his silly walks are a photo opportunity, even if the end result is unfortunately similar to Forrest Gump. Forrest Howard striding awkwardly from Beijing to Paris. Action man he ain't, but still... Beasley's weighty role for state. The Sunday Age boiled it down to the ultimate question of this staggeringly trivial pursuit. Who are you going to vote for? The little nerdy looking guy or the big fat jolly bloke? Well, when you put it like that, there's no contest. But the terrible mistake Beasley's minders have made is to buy this rubbish. And as a consequence, the cover of New Idea is adorned with... Stolen kisses. Al Pacino heals Kim's heartbreak. Mum's agony. I prayed Russell would rescue Meg. Wedding tragedy. Bride who dropped dead at the altar. And... Slim Kim. How I shed 12 kilograms with a super diet. This is a serious miscalculation and one that can only be made by people who don't know what they're doing. This is what they're doing. You don't stay on top of things unless you try. Subtext, can a man who can't handle a diet handle the country? Beasley's spin doctors have painted their man into a corner. In the Fairfax Herald, Ann Summers pads the diet story out for a thousand words, seriously, with such profound observations as... This federal election threatens to be more about tummy. Well, we know from where that threat emanates. And what if Beasley backslides? The contest between Beasley and Howard will be, and already is, a complex and at times brutal clashing of wills. What's complex about it? And as for the brutal clash of wills, I suppose this is what she means. Polyester outrage. What does he do? He gets up and what his answer to me is, why well, would you do it? Well, of course we'd do it! It just doesn't work and neither do the scripted sound bites. It's also self-conscious and artificial. Prime Minister, will you now finally admit that your claims that the GST would be good for the economy were completely wrong and that it is now swinging like a wrecking ball through the Australian economy? Well, another day, another policy backflip. This is a backflip with pike and double twist. When people start talking about local roads who are politicians, there's always likely to be a smell of pork. Accused of prolixity, pretty weird when you look at those five second grabs, Beasley bridled and acted tough. I know I am described by you as on occasions as a little too prolix in the way in which I present things. Get used to it. Laurie Oakes, for one, found that difficult. Let's find out what you would do. Assuming the government doesn't return this, and there's no sign they will, when you become Prime Minister, if you become Prime Minister, will you return that one and a half billion dollars to motorists? Well, well, what I would do right now, Laurie, what I'd do right now, Laurie, is remove that last GST. But you're not in office. Do you're it. not in office now. Let's talk about if and when you are in office, would you, would you give that money back to motorists? But, but supposing we achieve success in that regard over the next couple of weeks, as I believe we will, a new set of conditions is created. But, but you say you won't answer the question. You're waffling. Yes, I, no, I'm not waffling. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes. Look, I'm Mr. giving you a very specific answer. But, but, but you, won't give, you won't give me an answer. <laughs> Happily for Labor, not many people see that stuff. Their impressions are derived from the six o'clock news, where a footballer's indiscretion with cocaine deserves much more coverage than any politician's enlightened drugs policy. And speaking of drugs, a very bad mistake from the Howard think tank. PM's deadly message. If we don't talk to our sons and daughters about drugs, you can be sure they will hear the wrong message from someone else. Absolutely stupid scare tactics labelled John Howard's tough on drugs campaign was kicked off a weekend ago, ornamented with a centrepiece of offensive complacency. Mr Howard and his wife Jeanette have never had problems with drugs and their children, Tim, Melanie and Richard. I suppose the one thing worse than a politician using his children for self-congratulation is doing it hypocritically. Prime Minister John Howard's son Timothy yesterday was fined $600 and disqualified from driving for six months after pleading guilty to driving with a blood alcohol level four times over the legal limit for his age group. 
I don't imagine Timothy Howard will thank his father for that. But what use is a politician's family if it can't be exploited to add a human face to pious repetitions such as Howard practices or his spin-doctoring ghostwriters do whenever he plods into print? Our openness, friendliness, egalitarianism. Our social cohesion, a unique form of egalitarianism, the crowning achievement of the Australian experience. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. I regard Australia's social cohesion, born out of a distinctive form of egalitarianism, as the crowning achievement of the Australian experience. And for those up the back? Our social cohesion, flowing directly from a unique form of egalitarianism, is arguably the crowning achievement of the Australian... Yes, thank you. Where would speechwriters be without word processors? So here we go into the policy-free election, where the conservative subtext isn't a tough-on-drugs policy so much as a tough-on-obesity tactic. Curious that the media run with it, but won't touch Howard's own affliction. Only one, David Laser, and this was during the last federal election campaign, attempted to confront it. The trouble with John Howard appears to be that his personal handicap of deafness over which he's bravely sought to triumph has become a metaphor for his relationship to the country. And I suppose his comb-over is a metaphor for his inability to face facts. He finds it hard to hear the tragic notes, the imperceptible sounds. Well, we all find those hard to hear, David. The finer subtleties, the cries and melodies and song lines of his country. Style over substance is what we're going to get. The presidentialism began with Keating, whose minders rather liked the Clinton al fresco walk, so they roped off journos at Parliament House and kept his retreat open, all adopted with alacrity and a couple of flags by Howard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr Anderson and I have uh, called this uh, news conference concerning the price of fuel in Australia. And I blame Paul Murphy for starting those not-so-great debates along presidential lines back in 1990. Welcome to the Great Debate, coming live from ABC Television Studios in Sydney. And these days, the really big issue is whether our Kerry or their Ray gets the gig. So let's get down to it. Last time, John Hewson won the toss. This time, it was Paul Keating's turn. He's won the toss. John Howard has won the toss and he has decided to begin tonight, so let's kick it off briefly. Why should you lead us into the next century, John? And don't expect anything different this time. Good night to you.